At Tomaton Distillery, we are incredibly focused on promoting the Highlands of Scotland and our local area. The distillery itself inspires the community. We have 29 houses on site where everybody that works at the distillery gets the opportunity to live. The Highlands of Scotland has some fantastic local produce, it has some fantastic views, it has wonderful places to visit with incredible historical significance including castles and battlefields. But the two things that are probably closest to my heart are golf and single malt scotch whisky. We are here today at Castle Stewart Golf Links with Jeremy Matt, Director of Golf, to learn about the connections between Tomatin Distillery, Castle Stewart Golf Links and the game of golf. So Jeremy, tell us, how did somebody from upstate New York end up working at Castle Stewart Golf Links? Well, uh, first of all, Scott, uh, thank you very much for, uh, for being here today. It's, uh, it's always nice to see our friends from Tomatin here at Castle Stewart Golf Links. It's been a nice, long, outstanding relationship that we've had with you guys. And normally it's when you're here for a game of golf with some of your clients and guests and just saying a quick hello. But uh, when Jennifer had sent me through the email to say I might have an opportunity to talk a little bit about uh, Castle Stewart, the game of golf, talk about some whiskey and, and more importantly, try some whiskeys, it was, uh, it was a bit of a no brainer for us. So thank you for having me. Um, how does a guy from Kessler, from, from the Highlands of, uh, or from upstate New York, how does a guy from upstate New York end up in the Highlands of Scotland? It's always, uh, it's always one answer, a girl. Um, so a lot of people think that I came, you know, for Castle Stewart alone, you know, working in the golf industry for 20 some odd years now. Um, people think, oh, you came over here to work at Castle Stewart. Uh, I've been very fortunate to end up at Castle Stewart, but that was very much through the relationship with, uh, with my wife. She's from the tiny town of Dingwall which is only about 22 miles uh, you know, from Castle Stewart itself. I worked at a, a golf course in Rhode Island, which was a sister club to Skibo Castle for many years, Carnegie Abbey. So there was quite a few Brits and particularly Scots that, that worked at uh, Carnegie Abbey. And uh, there happened to be just a, a, a beautiful blonde uh, Scottish girl that was there with an accent that, uh, that I just, yeah, mel melted my heart. And a few years later we married and uh, when we found out we were having our daughter Bailey uh, that's when we decided to make the move and uh, I'd visited Scotland on many occasions for, for four or five years and, and fell in love with the country and particularly up here in the Highlands. Um, so very fortunate that the year that we decided to move over in 2009 was the same year that Castle Stewart was, was opening. So. Yeah, that's it. A girl, a, a girl. I, I think we've all gone places for girls or boys or whatever, whatever everybody gets into. Um, so, in terms of, what, there's obviously differences between golf in Scotland and golf in the United States. What was golf like growing up for you? Golf for me growing up was, uh, you know, when I was younger in my teens, was picking on my buddies on the golf team because it was, uh, you know, for me at that point, I was uh, playing baseball, playing soccer playing basketball um, were, were really my sports when I was in my teens. And so my buddies who were on the golf team uh, and our high school had a fantastic golf team. I remember sitting out uh, uh, having lunch with uh, one of my good pals, Michael Hickey, and, and picking on him for being on the golf team and, and playing an old man's <laughs> game. Um, and, uh, you know, and here we are, you know, fast forward, you know, 25 years and, uh, and I'm the director of golf at uh, one of the top, top 50 courses in the world. Um, so, you know, the game of golf wasn't really in my mindset as a, as a young guy. It was, it was when I was out of, out of high school, um, late teens, early 20s. Um, organized sport was maybe slightly harder to, to, to you know, get together and, and play, you know, 18 guys to get together and play baseball just was, was difficult. You know, we're all busy and between school and work and all that stuff. So I needed to find something that I could, uh, I could do to have a bit of fun and golf really ticked the box for me. I started playing in my home club in, in Hoosick Falls, New York, Hoosick Falls Country Club. And it's a nine hole course, tree lined, hilly, parkland. Um, but it was just a great place for me to learn learn the game of golf and I mean there was times that first summer I started playing I would go around it four and five times in a day and if I wasn't going around the golf course there was a little practice hole in the middle and I'd be there trying to work on my short game and uh, yeah it was humble beginnings I was absolutely terrible and there's some guys <laughs> back in Hoosick Falls could tell you some really funny stories about me at 19 and 20 and 21 playing golf um, but again here we are 41 years old uh, director of golf at Castle Stewart still an amateur golfer play off a handicap of five now uh, rather than the 25 back then <laughs> but you know there's no doubt the game of golf here in the Highlands is very different from from where I started uh, I absolutely love Lynx golf 
Um, I've fallen in love with it over the last 10, 15 years. And it's a, it's a very different game of golf than, than what we had in America and what we had in upstate New York. But I think it's, you know, it is the home of golf. And I think that's a big reason why we get so many visitors coming to the Highlands and coming to Scotland. Um, and what a wonderful combination with, uh, with whiskey and golf. You know, it's a, it's, a, it's a perfect combination for the golfers coming over from America. We've got a castle here on the grounds as well. So it all comes together quite nicely. It does. It's, uh, I, I still get excited every time I drive along through the gates and you, you come through and you just see the Art Deco clubhouse and you, you just get excited for coming out into, the, into the, such a fantastic golf course. It's, a, it's the same with the golf that we're spoilt with up here in the Highlands in general. You know, there's so much, there's just, I think that's what people don't understand is the amount of golf that's actually up here in the Highlands. You can, you can I mean, I don't even know how many courses there are along this coast, but there's some beautiful heathland courses, everything up here. It's just fantastic, isn't it? Oh, no doubt about it. You know, you come up the A9 and through the Cairngorm Mountains and, you know, right next to the doorsteps of Tamont Distillery is Spey Valley and Boat of Garten, wonderful golf courses on their own right, as you say, more heathland type courses. And you get up here into Inverness and you've got, you know, Castle Stewart and, and Nairn just down the road from us. Nairn Dunbar is a wonderful golf course as well. I'm a member at Royal Dornick. I'm a member at Tain. Um, we're just so fortunate with all the different golf courses. I mean, Brora is one of the most unique golfing experiences that you're going to have. Um, it's yeah, we're, we're we're certainly spoiled for choice, aren't we? It's it's just a wonderful place to come and play golf. So, I, I touched upon your experiences of golf growing up. What were your experiences of whiskey growing up? Whiskey, yeah. <laughs> I mean, when I was a, when I was a young guy, there wasn't. A, I, I didn't drink a lot of whiskey uh, growing up in the states. My my first experiences really for whiskey was my first visit to to Scotland um, with you know a proper single, single malt. Um, I hadn't drunk a lot of whiskey uh, until then. I had ended up with, with, my, uh, with my wife at, at my father-in-law's house in Dingwall. And um, you know, uh, my father-in-law Billy is kind of a local legend there. And I sat down in the house and he said, it's just obligatory. Here you are, it's the first time across the door and, and here's your whiskey. And uh, I have to admit that first sip uh, took my breath away a little bit. You know, I was more of a beer drinker at the time. So there was a bit of gulping when you have your first sip of, uh, of a pint. Um, so I wouldn't recommend to any, any new whiskey drinkers out there to take that first big sip the way you did out of a whiskey. But now I, I'm, a, I'm a huge fan of whiskey. I really enjoy it. And um, again, it's, it's one of those things over the last uh, 10, 15 years, I've grown to love Lynx Golf and, uh, and uh, well, yeah, I love whiskey even more. Yeah, there's, there's definitely a synergy between the two the, between the two products and I think I think that's what you you have here and I think researching the the building of Castle Stewart it was the attention to detail that went in a uh, in terms of the design in terms of the actual property that was here that's where I just saw so many similarities between the way single malt whiskey is made especially a whiskey like decades two here you know mm -hmm. it's constructed through from five different decades. We have whiskey from the 1970s, 80s, 90s, 2000s, 2010s. But I know that there was inspiration taken from the, hist from the history of golf in the creation of Castle Stewart. Can you tell me a bit about that? Well, yeah, Mark Parson, our co-designer, he worked here with Gil Hans to, uh, to build and design the course. And, uh, and as you say, you know, Mark very much wanted to pay homage um, to golf back in the 20s, 30s, and 40s. Um, he's a huge Alistair McKenzie um, disciple, um, you know, the, the course designer at Tagusta National, also the course designer down at the old course. He's taken huge inspiration from Alistair McKenzie. I mean, the big, the big thing for Mark was, you know, to, there, was a, there was a period of golf um, where it became the harder the better. You know, it was that U.S. Open mentality from the Shinnecocks of the 80s and 90s where, you know, it's, let's give them a proper test of golf. And course design for many years, you know, became that, you know, how hard can we make the golf course? And Mark didn't want it to be that way. He wanted to pay homage, um, you know, to, to earlier bygone area of, of golf where you know, when you walked off the course like you do, or he certainly talked about, when he walked off the golf course at the old course, the first thing he wanted to do was walk over to the first tee and just do it all over again. You know, whereas there's maybe other courses you know, you know, in, in the world and, and here in Scotland where it's, it's about a championship test of golf, how hard can we make it? And, and Mark always talked about when I, when I played those courses, I wanted to walk into the bar and, and, and have a whiskey and a, and a pint to make me feel better about myself. So we're very and appreciative so. for those courses <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> from, from a whiskey sales point Absolutely. of view. But Absolutely. yeah, no, I think, that, I think the playability is what makes it such a wonderful test here. I mean, even 
uh, the, the golf course itself is is still tremendously difficult. I think when when you say th when you hear things like that, people often think it's going to be easy. But the golf course is is anything but easy. But the, just the elements that went into the design were were incredibly, incredibly clever. Well, you talk about the attention to detail that went into the whiskey, and, and like you say, the attention to detail that went into the building of the golf course, so that making sure that we could take advantage of the vistas that we have here, looking out to Shannery Point, looking out to the Keswick Bridge, um, you know, using the castle on the fourth hole as a backdrop and those infinity edges. There's no doubt that there's, there's attention to detail and there's definitely synergy between Castle Stewart and Taman. Definitely. I mean, I think that really helps promote the local area and it shows just how much the the course is inspired by the local area. It's uh, it, the local area is incredibly important to what we do at Tomatin as well. You know, we're inspired by the people of the Highlands and also by the the area around us. Even down to the detail in our packaging is all surrounding the the local area and the Highlands of Scotland. What always strikes me as being an incredible part of what you do here is everything surrounding hospitality. And I think that's what everybody that comes to visit that I speak to um, emphasises is just is the welcome from the very beginning, from the moment that you drop off your car, drop off your clubs, to the halfway house, to Elspeth and her team when you come back in. How, how much focus do you put on the hospitality? Because it seems to be something that happens very naturally, but... Yeah, I, I, hopefully it does come across that it happens very naturally, but it is, there's no doubt about it that it's a huge part of the experience. Um, you know, yes, the golf course is fantastic. Yes, it's enjoyable, fun to play. You know, it does, it does test everyone, but you need to have the full package these days. You know, we, we talked about all the golf courses that we have in Scotland and have here in the Highlands, and, you know, it's a very competitive market. And, you know, you, you can't just be a good golf course or you can't just have good hospitality. You have to have it all, you know, to make sure that your, your business can thrive. Um, so, I mean, I think Highland hospitality going back 25 years ago was potentially poor service with a smile. Um, but certainly my experience visiting and, and over the last 10 or 15 years, you know, the, the hospitality in Scotland, the hospitality in the Highlands in particular has gone to a whole nother level, both here at Castle Stewart. And, and you know, we like to think we had something to do with that. You know, that the mentality that Mark brought in in 2009, you know, of having those hospitality levels have meant that other places around the area and other places in Scotland have maybe looked to that and thrived on that. Um, I know I've been down to the, the visitor center down in Tomatin, so it's, it's certainly not lost on us that the same thing happens down with you guys in, in the distillery. You know, there's a friendly face there at the, at the center. There's always a, the tours that I've been on with guests from America have been fantastic. I mean, I had Graham Ewanson's daughter uh, showing us around four or five years ago when the, when the, when the, the visitor center had, had kind of first been refurbished and reopened and all that stuff. So I think, you know, it, it goes hand in hand. You know, you need to have the wonderful whiskeys. You know, you have all the attention to detail and all the work that goes into it. But when people are visiting the, the, the distillery, it's the same thing. You know, you have to have that hospitality go along with it. And that's certainly the case here as well. Um, and there's, there's no mistake, you know, that, you know, it, I'm glad that it comes off naturally. And that's definitely the feedback. It's a very relaxed environment and you're, you're looked after well. But um, uh, there's a lot of work and thought that's put into it. I mean, um, you know, Elspeth started with Mark Parson down at King's Barnes, you know, in the early 2000s. And, um, you know, she was working at a course out in the Isla at the time. And, you know, it, it wasn't a mistake that, you know, Mark had handpicked her to take her to open King's Barnes. And we were just really fortunate that, you know, she was coming back to this area, you know, um, in, the, in the early 2010s. And uh, she's been with us now for, for six, seven years. And, you know, she's kind of the heartbeat of the clubhouse here. And, um, and, and her team, you know, follows in her footsteps. And, Again, there's there's nothing there's nothing um, overly formal about the hospitality. It is very much a relaxed environment. You know, you can wear your soft spikes in the clubhouse. It's a very welcoming, and um, you know, and, and I'm glad that, that that comes across to you and your team. Yeah, I think it's everybody finds it just incredibly natural. Um, in, in terms of the in terms of the actual golf course itself, it's evolved. I mean, what was it like when you first arrived here in 2009? You were here from the very beginning, weren't you? I was here from the very beginning. Um, I, I started with, the, with Castle Stewart in April of 2009. Um, we opened in the July. My first visit actually was in October of 2008. Uh, we had come over, uh, my wife and I, to, to tell her family that um, not only were we getting ready to have a baby, but we were getting ready to make the, the big move to Scotland as well. Um, and that was when my father-in-law had said to me, oh, there's a, there's a new course opening up over by the airport. We'll go for a visit on Sunday. And that was our last day. We were flying out on the Monday. And I thought, it's going to be a wee nine-holer in the north of Scotland. There'll be no job opportunities here. 
I had some connections at Glen Eagles, at Makrahanish, and some places that had been more you know, well-established. And at that point, you know, you know, Castle Stewart wasn't, wasn't very well known. Um, so yeah, I came over here and I stood on the elevated 10th tee, um, you know, uh, overlooking the vista and, and, of the Firth and, and Shannery Point, and I just, I was blown away by it. Um, so yeah, and, and I mean, it's, there's no doubt that uh, it's a wonderful piece of property. You know, when Mark and, and Stuart got here in the early years of construction, you know, to have the two different levels of the golf course. You've got the lower levels that play right along the Firth, and then you've got the higher levels that uh, overlook that and, and overlook the, the Black Isle. Uh, it's, a, it's a very unique property, and, um, you know, from a design standpoint, you know, you know Mark was really keen to work with Gil and, and Jim Wagner because Gil is now one of the best course architects in, in the world. And, um, you know, probably one of the best things um, about Gil is that he doesn't have one way of doing things. You know, he works with the course, he works with the, the, the folks at the different golf courses and wants to know what your objective is, you know. And Mark's objective here was to make it a playable golf course for your everyday golfer, but still have the ability to, to test the best players in the world. And that's a really difficult combination to pull off. Yeah, and I will get to, uh, I've got some questions lined up for further down the line about the inspiration between some of the, the, the best golfers in the world have given to this place. But I think what we'll, we'll talk a little bit about the whiskey. So Tomatin Decades 2 is a multi-vintage single malt whiskey. Uh, the whiskey takes inspiration from the various different decades. Tomatin distillery itself has gone under a fantastic transformation over the last 50 years. But Tomatin Decades 2 pays a homage to Graham Yunsen's craft. You, you talked a little bit about his golf game, but we won't get too much into that today. But we'll certainly get into his whiskey creation, which is fantastic. And what, what I thought we could do is maybe pair it a little bit with the different decades and see how that's affected golf in general and single malt whiskey. So the, the first whiskey, and in fact, over a quarter of the recipe of this whiskey is m matured in American oak casks from the 1970s. So a quarter of this whiskey is over 40 years old, which is just breathtaking. And uh, the whiskey, as it's spent 40 years maturing in the warehouses in Tomatin, it's got lovely uh, tropical fruit notes that emerge, which hope, when we get to tasting the whiskey at the end, hopefully you'll start to pick up on. Um, but I'll, I'll, the American oak, American uh, oak is incredibly important to the whiskey industry, and I think it was also incredibly important to golf in the 1970s. You know, we had Jack Nicholas, Tom Watson, and Arnold Palmer. Now, I know that Arnold Palmer visited this property. What was it like to have Ar Arnold Palmer as a guest here? Uh, it, was a, it was a very unique experience. Uh, it was in 2015 that, that Mr. Palmer was um, down in St. Andrews uh, for the, uh, for the um, Open Championship and uh, he flew up here uh, on his jet and I just felt really privileged. I, I got to, to shake his hand as he came off the plane and, and drive him over here to Castle Stewart. Uh, and what an amazing man, what, what amazing things that he did for the game of golf. Um, but to have him here, you know, sitting where we're sitting, Scott, and he spent three days up in the Highlands, and, and the last day um, that he was here, he just wanted to relax. And we kind of had an open four or five hours where we thought, well, we'll just go upstairs, have some canapes, and, um, and just sit upstairs and enjoy the view, just thinking, oh, that's a lot of time to fill. Um, Mr. Palmer, you know, his first drink that he had up here was, was a whiskey. Um, so I, I have to admit, although he did enjoy it, he, he was a vodka drinker, so he did, he did go in from having his one whiskey uh, on, on to vodka, but uh, he, he just, he, he loved being here. He, he appreciated um, the vista that we have, you know, not just here at Castle Stewart, but also the different changing lights. And you hear that from a lot of guests, you know, when they come to the Highlands and, and to Scotland. It's, it's, just, it's just a bit different in terms of the light. And he sat here for eight hours, you know, sitting, talking. One of the things that I felt like was so special about Mr. Palmer was how he made other people feel like you were the only person in the room. Um, he came through the clubhouse, he shook hands, he said hello, but it wasn't a passing and just kind of on you go, on you go. He really touched each person and made, made them feel you know, special. And, and that was definitely the case when you know, our small team were up here with him. You know, he, he sat and chatted with the chef about you know, you know, his, his flight and his piloting days. And you know, as he got older, one of the things that he found really hard was having to give up his pilot's license and not be allowed to have that anymore. And he sat and chatted with our chef for 30 minutes. And um, he's just a, a lovely, lovely man. And we were so special to have him you know, here and visiting you know, the property for a few days. Yeah, and I think that era in general has just inspired golf. You know, I think that's really when 
we, you've noticed it's almost the beginning of the modernization of golf. The 1970s were very important to golf, weren't they? Absolutely. I mean, you talked about Tom Watson there as well, and, um, and you talked about the transformation of the distillery over the last 50 years. Well, Tom Watson had to transform his mindset in terms of playing Lynx golf. Uh, he, he had won multiple Open Championships, but many people forget when he first started coming over to play in these Opens, he really struggled. And one of the things that he talked about was the fact that he was trying to manipulate his game too much. And that actually trying to hit low draws or trying to maneuver the ball a lot was, wasn't the right way forward for him. You know, he, what he had to do was just hit solid golf shots. And whether that shot was hit low, medium, or high, it would pierce through the wind and get to where it wanted to be. So, you know, we've, we've all had to go through a bit of transformation. The distillery's done that. You know, Tom Watson had to, in a way, transform his mindset into a way how to, how to play open championship venues here in Scotland. I think that brings us on beautifully to a decade that transformed Tomatin's history and to, to transformed the way Tomatin is today. The 1980s is a decade where Tomatin went from being the biggest distillery in Scotland um, to having a much smaller production and we focused much more on the consistency of our spirit uh, and we've also focused on using a variety of different cask finishes. So uh, in Tomatin decades too, the smallest amount of whiskey actually comes from the 1980s, uh, but all of this has been matured in Spanish Oloroso sherry casks, so casks that have previously held Oloroso sherry. So this will give a much bigger f dried fruit flavours coming through. Uh, for me, Oloroso sherry al almost provides a sort of savoury context, a little bit of a meatiness in there as well. It's not too sweet, but it really starts to ramp up the flavour. Um, and the 1980s in golf were also inspired by one Spanish golfer, Severiano Ballesteros, and I think that the way that he, the way that he played golf was a completely different mindset to how the rest of the rest of the field were playing golf at that time. What did you think about Seve? Well, I mean, Seve is probably a wee bit of a sore subject for an American because uh, <laughs> he, he changed the Ryder Cup, didn't he? Well, that's he, a, I was going to get uh, onto that for yeah, the 1980s. The <laughs> you know, I, I really wish that Seve would have had the opportunity to play Castle Stewart because I, I think he would have absolutely loved it. Um, the, the premium around here is, is having that creativity and having that short game. Um, I mean, you see winners like Phil Mickelson that have played out here before. You know, it, it's, it's, it's not necessarily about being the straightest and more at, most accurate of, of drivers of the golf ball, but being able to know how to get your ball into the hole. And Seve was the best at that, wasn't he? You know, um, Billy Foster, I watched recently, you know, caddied for, for Seve for many years. He said as long as Seve could keep it in play, he was going to win the golf tournament. You know, because he just chipped and putted and had that creativity more than anybody else. And uh, certainly in the 80s, you know, he was he was right there in his prime. And uh, and, and like we say, it's when when he, he got involved with the Ryder Cup, things changed. It stopped being a, an American just um, victory dance and it became <laughs> much, much more competitive uh, with the with the very fiery and competitive Seve. But I think that's I, I think the Ryder Cup and the evolution of the Ryder Cup has been great for the game of golf. It's really helped it grow in the continent of Europe as well as coming over from the United States. So, in terms of your visitors that you get here, where where do most of them come from? Uh, we'll do about twenty thousand rounds a year, um, and on average, and um, probably nearly nearly half of those will come from North America. You know, um, type of an idea. But we also have a lot of return business. You know, from from more domestic market. You know, here in Scotland and the UK. I'm very fortunate to, although we don't have traditional members, we do have a, a corporate program with with thirty companies, half of which are local here to the Highlands, and the other half are further afield. So, um, kind of from all over kind of from all over, but we do get uh, a few coming up from Spain and uh, enjoying the, the, the Highland Lynx and uh, Lynx Golf in Scotland. Uh, there's no doubt about that. It's, it's amazing to see the bread, the visitor that's come into the Highlands these days. We're so lucky up at the distillery that we've been fortunate for, to be able to grow the visitor numbers up to close to 50,000. Obviously this year for um, logistical reasons and the and coronavirus that, that we haven't managed to get achieve those visitor numbers is the same, but I. I People are going to start coming back. The, the Highlands aren't closed forever and when we do it's going to be great to be able to welcome them to places like Castle Stewart and back up to Tomatin Distillery. And I think uh, we, we saw it uh, after the, the lockdown for a couple of months, the pent up demand to play golf and uh, once, once the travel restrictions are lifted, uh, when, whenever that takes place, 
there's going to be no doubt there's going to be pent up demand all over the world to come to Scotland. Um, you know, the, the Highlands of Scotland are one of the safest places when it comes to uh, the recent challenges we had or have are having. Um, so, but there's no doubt that people want to get back and uh, savor some whiskey, visit some castles, play some golf, and um, yeah, we're, we're we're looking forward to that as much as you are. Yeah, and have some very good parties as well. I think that's very Absolutely. important. Absolutely. Um, and the 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 third decade that we take whiskey from in decades two is the 1990s. In fact, over a quarter of this whiskey comes from 1995, and it's all been matured in American oak again and I think I, I would say that the 1990s were, were dominated by one golfer in particular um, the, it was the emergence of a certain Mr Tiger Woods um, but at the same time though golf has also, it also managed to start to change its reputation ever so slightly would you agree that we I think that's when a lot of the perhaps perceived stuffiness came out of golf and was able to inspire golfers from many different backgrounds. Oh, it was definitely a broader market. I mean, um, you know, you, you mentioned Tiger there with um, the, the 1995. That was about the same time that he turned professional. Um, he won the Masters there in 97 and, and, and really took off the, the game of golf to a whole other level. Um, there's no doubt about that. He, he kind of made golf cool, you know, whereas it was much so as I you know, said earlier for me as, as being in high school, was it was an old man's game. Um, but all of a sudden you get Tiger Woods coming in and you know, maybe people forget to, you know, laterally in his career, but certainly early in his career, he was very dynamic. And you remember making the hole in one at the Phoenix Open and giving it the raise of the roof, which was, and it just brought and encompassed more young people into the game of golf and, uh, and yeah, people from all walks of life. Yeah, I mean, and, uh, the, the whiskey that we've had in here from 1995, so even with there, that, that's whiskey that's 25 years old that's gone into Tomatin Decades too. So over half of this whiskey in front of us is over 25 years old, which is, there's an awful lot of history in there. Castle Stewart's history is perhaps not so long, and we talked earlier about how uh, the local area and golf beforehand has inspired it. but. In terms of the opening and the launch of Castle Stewart in 2009, what, what was that actually like to be a part of? What was it like to open up a brand new golf course? It was, it was a lot of fun. Um, it was kind of crazy at the same time. Um, we opened on the 13th of July. I think this building was handed to us on the 11th of July. So we had two days to get all the furniture in, get the kitchen fitted out, get the golf shop fitted out and up and running. Um, but you know what, it brings, it brings the team together, um, you know, because you're, you're working side by side and, and working hard to get it across the finish line. So it was certainly interesting times, but it's great to be part of a project and see it grow. You know, there's, there's no doubt that there was some, some quiet times in 2009 and 2010 and Scottish opening coming in uh, in, in 2011, 12 and 13 uh, certainly helped put us up on the golfing map. And, you know, our main objective here, one of our main objectives was to try to get more visiting golfers to Scotland to come to the Highlands. We wanted to complement the other uh, courses here locally, bring visitors to the area. It's part of the reason why we're not members club. We didn't come here to compete with the other members clubs to, to for their members. It was very much about you know trying to get more visitors to the Highlands and uh, and hopefully have those visitors play multiple courses when they're up and visiting. Yeah, and I, I think that the very fact that we now have destinations like Castle Stewart, there's no doubt that's going to impact on even even the likes of the local castles you mentioned there, but also the restaurants in Inverness. We I think now we've got some amazing places to eat in Inverness, Cafe One, Rockpool, uh, Mustard Seeds, and then even further afield, all across the Highlands, we're inspired by fantastic uh, local produce, which I... I know that is important to what you do here as well. I think the local produce makes a difference. You often see that you've got local beers stocked, and of course, having our your local whiskey stocked is very important as well. Absolutely, we you know local produce. You talk about you know the fish and you know the sausages are all from 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 local vendors, and tomato are only what nine miles down the the A9 from us as well. So we always have plenty of tomato and both <laughs> in, both for sale in the golf shop and for a dram in the restaurant and. Uh, the Black Isle is right behind us here, and the uh, Black Isle beer is, is one of the beers that we have down in the restaurant as well. So it is important to us to, to, to be part of the local community and support the, the different local businesses. And, and it's great when we get that support back from, from those businesses as well. So you mentioned there about 2013 and the Scottish Open. Um, I know the Scottish Open first came here in 2011. Did was Luke Donald win the first year? That's correct, yeah. Yeah, that, Luke Donald won the first year. I was here uh, for one of the days. Um, but 
I, I feel that 2013 was really the year where the Scottish Open was put on the map. I remember the competition being at Loch Lomond when, when you were growing up and you'd watch it on television. Um, but really when Phil came here and won in 2013, it, it, it put the Scottish Open on the map because everybody was talking about it because he obviously then went on to win the Open Championship at Muirfield. Um, we have a, another connection here in the fact that the youngest whisky in here is uh, from French oak casks from 2013. Whilst I was doing my research, the closest link I could find that, to that was Raphael Jacqueline finished in the top 10 that year. So that was the closest I could get to the, Fre the French link and the, the inspiration behind having French casks in here. But Phil Mickelson winning here must have done wonders for Castle Stewart Golf Links. There's no, there's no doubt that Phil did wonders. Uh, Raphael is actually a great connection to have to the whiskey because um, he, he's, he's, a, he's a really, really lovely guy. Um, a fantastic guy and, uh, and I look forward to tasting the whiskey because I'm sure it's going to be fantastic. Fantastic. But also you look at Raphael and you know he's put a nice long career together. You know he, he really has uh, stood the test of time. Um, he's been on tour probably now for 20 years um, and you know, kept his card and has always been a consummate professional. So that's not a bad connection to have to a yeah. distillery that uh, you know has a wonderful history as well. But there's no denying that um, you know Phil in 2013, that was the year that things kind of came together for Castle Stewart Golf Links um, and that Scottish Open. And, and as you say, putting Castle Stewart on the map, that was the first year that the European Tour had put a deal together with NBC Sports in America, where we were going to be shown on the Saturday and the Sunday um, on live, live television on, on network TV. And we were a bit fortunate, you know, we had some unlucky weather in 2011, um, where we had a, 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 a day of play abandoned due to rain. Um, and it was also unfortunate in 2013 for the, the tournament that was on the PGA Tour, they had some horrendous rain and the tournament was actually canceled that week. So not only did we get the Saturday and Sunday coverage on NBC Sports, but NBC covered uh, the Scottish Open on the Thursday and Friday as well to fill some airtime that they couldn't fill with, their, with their, their live event there from the States. So there's no doubt it came together. And of course, Phil has always talked so highly about uh, the Highlands of Scotland and so highly about Castle Stewart, um, even in his first visit in 2011. Um, before he come, you know, to win in 2002. I think the winner always loves the golf course, but uh, but, <laughs> Phil, but Phil loved the golf course even before before he won, and um, and I think if you if you asked him, you know, I think the Highlands in, in general, he he really found to be a special place. He brought his family here, you know, uh, both in 2011 and in 2013 when he visited. So. He, he loves the Highlands of Scotland, and uh, I don't think he's uh, afraid to have a wee dram now and again, and again as well. Yeah, well, that's, that's very good. Hopefully one day we can get him up to Tomatin Distillery. That'd be great. Um, uh, Tomatin's connection with um, professional golf in Scotland is really linked behind the, uh, the Highland Golf Links Pro-Am. I know it's a competition where you and I have both been fortunate enough to play in on several occasions. Um, the Highland Golf Links Pro-Am, which has played uh, here at Nairn Golf Club and at Royal Dornoch as well. For me, it's allowed, it gives me that little glimpse into what it's like to be a professional sportsman, which unfortunately, despite the amount of golf that I play, is a dream that I'm having to forgive now. <laughs> but I, being part of that tournament is an incredibly special three days. Um, we'll, we'll put more information about how to get in touch and how to perhaps look into becoming a participant in the tournament next year. But what, what are your experiences of the Highland Golf Links Pro-Am? For, for me, that, that week, um, where the Lynx courses in the Highlands, um, you know, team up with Tamatin is so special. Um, and it really goes back to what whiskey and golf does. It brings people together, you know, and um, whether you're, you're sitting around the fire with your family, having a dram, or you're out uh, with your buddies playing golf, you know, golf and whiskey bring people together. And, uh, and that week to have those, those two combinations of, of Tamatin and, and of Lynx golf, um, and that camaraderie that comes along with being out there with, with a couple of your pals, you know, be able to see what the professionals can do. Um, you know, you look at the scores this year with some of the pros, you know, going around Castle Stewart in 64, going around Dornick and Nairn in 62. I mean, it's quite remarkable what these guys can do. And, uh, you know, guys like yourself, guys like Graham Ewanson, I mean, we talked about Graham being a master distiller. He can't be a master golfer as well. That would just be, <laughs> that'd be unfair in life, wouldn't it? We can't be talented so, at all things. So, exactly. <laughs> but no, it is, it is a really special week. Um, it, we're, so, we're so lucky to have Tamatin as, as the headline sponsor for that event. 
event. Um, the, the event has grown, uh, you know, gone from strength to strength. And, um, you know, next year, I just think it, it's going to be the best yet. It seems to get better all the time, and next year's going to be the best yet. Yeah, we were very fortunate to be able to play it this year, and it was great to be able to have a little element of normality about. But I think hopefully next year we can start to welcome in the overseas visitors once again and really make make the best three days of it. Yeah. I mean, my, my fondest memory uh, from, from playing in, in the, the Tomatin HJL Pro-Am was actually sitting up in this room um, after our game of golf um, in 2019 with, with my team. And uh, the three of us got the, the opportunity to try the 30-year-old the and the 36-year-old as part of a whiskey tasting that all the participants were, were able to come up here into this top floor lounge and, and try to you know, taste uh, two really special um, whiskeys. And um, we had a, a, one of the team from Tomatin here giving us the tasting notes as well, which makes such a big difference. You know, and, and that's one of the things that we try to do out here in the golf course. Um, you know, when you tell people what they're getting ready to try, they have a real appreciation. You know, you can actually smell the notes that you're talking about. You, you taste the taste when you just plant those seeds. Uh, and we try to do the same thing out in the golf course, you know, before visitors go out in the course, you know, explain to them the different distinct course features out there, you know, the width and the fairways, but how you have to have the angle of attack, you know, the infinity edge greens, you know, the chunk bunkering and the seclusion of holes. Those tasting notes are so important, both when it comes to trying a, a new whiskey and when it comes to trying a new golf course. It all helps create an experience, yeah, absolutely. And, and that's what we're that's what we're trying to do with single malt whiskey. Uh, single malt whiskey is more than just the drink itself; it's the craft that's gone into it. It's the people that uh, the people that are making the whiskey, but it's also who you're drinking the whiskey with and where you're drinking it. So that's why I think that the, both golf and single malt Scotch whiskey go so well together. Um, but I think we've built the whiskey up so much that it's definitely time to have a little sample. Absolutely. I know we've been sitting here itching our feet. <laughs> I know, I know. <laughs> you know. <laughs> so what we have in front of us here is Tomatin Decades 2. Um, so in terms, of, in terms of tasting whiskey, what we're about at Tomatin is we want everybody to enjoy the experience. There's an awful lot of people in this world that will tell whiskey, to tell people how whiskey should and shouldn't be drunk. Um, but the most important thing is for you to enjoy what you're drinking in front of you. Um, we've talked a little bit about the whiskey so far. So we've got whiskey from the 1970s, which is going to give you incredible depth of flavor, mostly surrounding these beautiful tropical fruit notes that come from the long maturation up in the Scottish Highlands, up in the mountains. But we also have some notes that will come through from the Oloroso sherry casks from the 1980s. We've got more American oak from the 1990s, which will give a much more sort of creamier and buttery sort of flavour. Uh, and in the 2000s, we've got recharred Verdeo hogsheads, so casks that have previously held Verdeo wine, and we've stripped them back and charred them, which again creates these big vanilla notes. And then finally, a little bit of French oak, uh, inspired by Raphael Jacqueline. <laughs> no, um, so thank you very much for joining me today. Have a little nose and have a little taste of the whiskey. The nose is, what we're aiming to do with this whiskey is just to create a wide variety of flavor profiles. There's gonna be a lot of step change in there. So it should be a whiskey that should be evolving across the palate when you're drinking it. Um, again, this is all about the craft of Graham Munson. This is about the, his skill as a whiskey maker. Um, it's a whiskey that, is limited edition. Uh, we we don't make this on a regular basis. Once Dec Tomatin Decades Two is finished, there'll be there'll be no more left of it, um, and we'll be looking for the next part part of inspiration after that. But I hope you enjoy your single well, malt whiskey. And my, my mouth is now watering. And, <laughs> yeah, uh, <no>. absolutely. <laughs> yeah. So, cheers. Thank you very much. Yes. Cheers. Slanjava. Slanjava. So in there you'll get those, you should hopefully get some of those flavours that I was talking about. Uh -huh. um, I, I think this is actually a perfect single malt whiskey for golf because the, 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 the inspiration from all the different decades will allow it to have a lot of that relationship with golfers. This is whiskey that can be targeted for any consumer, somebody who doesn't... Um, who who's perhaps new to the category would still love some of the flavors in here because they're not they're not too overpowering there's a an element of balance in here likewise for somebody to be able to come and taste whiskey from the 1970s in uh in a single malt scotch whiskey that will be on the shelf at under 200 pounds uh, it's a it's a great opportunity to get some of those nuanced flavors from older whiskey so 
really, uh, this whisky can inspire many generations, just like golf and the Highlands of Scotland have all come together. But Jeremy, thank you very much for joining me today. And uh, hopefully we can catch up soon over some more whisky and golf. Scott, thank you very much for having me. I've really enjoyed it, uh, you know, the chat with you and spending some time with you. The whiskey is absolutely beautiful. As you say, it will, uh, it will reach out to loads of different people, your whiskey expert and your amateur drinker uh, as well, much like the golf course here at Castle Stewart, you know, test the best and uh, playable for the rest of us as well. So it's a, a wonderful partnership. It's a beautiful whiskey, and uh, I would re recommend to everyone to get out there and, uh, and get a bottle. It's beautiful. And likewise, everybody come here and play some golf. Cheers, gentlemen. Cheers.